Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And I'm so excited to bring you this conversation that I just had with Jay Warner Wallace, author of Cold Case Christianity, Forensic Faith, God's Crime Scene, and Person of Interest. And now he is here talking about his expanded and updated version of his original first book, Cold Case Christianity, which I've shared many times on this podcast was very life-changing for me. It was very helpful to me in my spiritual journey, and this conversation was so good. Some of the highlights for me is Jim walked us through what it's like to think like a detective. Of course, he approached the evidence for Christianity from the perspective of a cold case homicide detective, so it's this completely unique approach of how he treated Christianity as a cold case, and could he solve the case? And uh, of course, he became a Christian, and that's, that's part of his story. But in the book, he walks us through uh, just how to think like a detective, how to examine evidence, how to make inferences and think uh, critically. So we talked a little bit about that. A highlight for me was when he talked about jurors and what it what it in, in if you think about a courtroom, it's the jury that decides the conclusion, that, that decides the outcome. And often I feel discouraged. I don't know if you feel this way when somebody might approach some claim you've made and say, hey, you're not an expert in that area, so you have no right to speak to it. Well, Jim has a great analogy thinking about the courtroom situation in which you do have expert witnesses, but ultimately it's the jury that decides the outcome. And so in the in the case of examining the evidence, we are the jury. We get to decide, yes, I'm not an expert, I'm not a scholar, but I get to decide what conclusions I make based on the evidence and the expert witnesses and all those things. So I thought that was a really good point of the conversation. Probably my favorite part of the conversation is when we talked through how to answer skeptics who might say things like, um, you know, the Bible is unreliable, the, the New Testament, especially the Gospels, were not written by eyewitnesses, and that maybe these books were written many years later after the events, too far after the events to even know what actually happened. He talked for quite a while on how to answer that claim and also how to answer the claim of, you know, were they lying? Maybe even if we have an accurate copy of what they said, how do we know if they were even telling the truth? And as a homicide detective, uh, who is an expert in why people do bad things, Jim brought us such great information on, really, they would have no motivation to lie. And he ex went into detail about the three main reasons people lie or really do anything bad. And I just found that to be totally enlightening. So I am very excited for you to get to listen to this conversation with Jay Warner Wallace. Well, Jim, so glad to have you back on the podcast. You have been on before. We talked last time, I think, about your very wildly popular book, Person of Interest, about the life of Jesus. want to really encourage our viewers and listeners to go back and listen to that podcast and get that book. But one of the books that was really instrumental in my own faith journey was your first book, which was called Cold Case Christianity. In fact, I've shared this with you. I think I've even shared it on the podcast. I read it three times when I was really trying to stabilize uh, in my own faith and figure out if what I believed was true and what I even believed in the first place. Um, so I would love to start today by you sharing your testimony with us. You have a very unique story of coming to Christ. Of course, you have been a very successful cold case homicide detective in Los Angeles for many years, a pretty hardened atheist from what I understand about your story. But for anybody who's unfamiliar with you, tell us how you came to Christ. Now, I have to qualify this because I get in trouble with this whole thing with testimony because I've said publicly all the time that my testimony doesn't matter and either does yours. And when I say that, it's not because I don't think testimony matters. But here's what I have. In my family, I've got six half-siblings, uh, brothers and sisters, who were raised LDS by my stepmother. And they have remarkable testimonies. As a matter of fact, the LDS church kind of trains its people to be able to share their testimony. And that testimony does not make Mormonism true because it turns out what really matters is whether or not this is evidentially true. And that was my concern as an atheist. I was about 35 when I first uh, walked into a church with Susie. And she was more interested in doing this than I was. But my dad is somebody who as an atheist today would go to church with you. I mean, when I was a pastor, he would come to our church. <laughs> I became a pastor after I was, became a believer. And he would come to our church and he'd sing the songs. He'd go yeah. on. At, at one time he came and he actually went with us on a service project, a service trip. And but because he thinks this is a useful delusion. And I think I felt the same way. If you want to go to church, I'll go with you. 
not because I think it's true, because I think it's it's helpful for you. And I love my wife. I'm happy to go. But um, this pastor provoked me, and I was pretty outspoken because a lot of the people we would meet in the profession, you know, the people I take to jail would say they were Christians and all of us atheist police officers would mock these guys. So, so I was willing to go with her. And uh, the pastor said this thing that provoked me, said that Jesus was so smart, the most important person who ever lived kind of thing. And I thought, well, is that true? And so I bought a Bible. I still have it sitting back here on my shelf, uh, just a pew Bible, nothing special. <laughs> I didn't want to spend a lot of money on it. And I uh, started to examine the Gospels. And as I read through the Gospels, they provoked me because these are accounts that are not just proverbial wisdom statements of Jesus. They're, they're making claims about what they say happened at a particular place in the world, at a particular time in history. Well, th those kinds of claims can be tested. You know, my cold cases are basically unsolved murders from 30 to 40 years ago. And I no longer have access to the witnesses or the supplemental report writers, the detectives from the 1970s or whoever wrote the reports. So I have to make a uh, de decision about what really happened, even though I have no access to the original eyewitnesses or to the report writers. Well, that's really what we were talking about with the Gospels. So I simply looked at the, we have a certain template in place in California. It's true everywhere. Uh, in the United States. There's are the jury instructions that judges provide jurors with. And I simply applied those jury instructions to the Gospels to see if they would pass. And that's where um, I became convinced that these were telling me something true about Jesus. And I was not looking to confirm anything. I really wasn't trying to change my life. I didn't have a bad life. I had a great life. Um, so I was one just was curious as to what is true. And once I discovered it was true, I was in. Wow. And I've heard you talk about the Holy Spirit's role in that, too, because I think I heard you say one of the last pillars to fall in your atheism was the, was it the, the miraculous or the supernatural? Am I remembering that right? Right. That's really, that was the problem I had with the scriptures that, you know, I would have said that if you're like when we walk into a crime scene, we're not thinking, well, OK, it's going to be some human agent or it's going to be a demon. <laughs> no, we're not, we're, right. not, we're not considering the supernatural realm. So I, my biases were always going to be toward a natural explanation. And if, I always thought if you're doing history, well, that doesn't include supernatural elements. That's called mythology. It's a different genre. So I was unwilling to look at the Gospels as anything other than mythology because I had a bias against the supernatural. I needed to make sure that that bias was a reasonable bias. Um, you know, if it's not reasonable, then I could, I could ditch it and at least uh, hold that with an open hand. And that's really all I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to say, okay, I'm biased on, I, can I hold my doubts and concerns with an open hand? Now, you're right about the Holy Spirit thing. I, that, that is something I get a lot because there's this sense in all of us who are making a case for Christianity. Well, where does the Holy Spirit come in? Well, I don't think that there's any way I would have been interested in yeah. examining this case at all if the Holy Spirit wasn't working in me because it, I needed to re remove the bias, the, the objections I had in other words, I had an enmity toward God. I, I didn't just think it was false. I thought the people who believed this were stupid. And I needed to have that enmity removed so I could actually examine the case fairly. And I, I think that's something that only the Holy Spirit does. And yeah. so I, I think and that, that brought me to neutral. Now, I, I get it. A lot of folks who we, we know would say, well, no, there is no neutral. But what I mean is um, there was no way I would have started the investigation at all. So how does that how does that happen? Well, it happens because you know you make a uh, you, the spirit does something to remove your hatred long mm -hmm. enough for you to actually start an investigation. Yeah, that's good. So cold case Christianity, uh, you approach the gospels as a cold case. Let's you know you walk the reader through your investigation, and now this is ten years later. And congratulations, by the way, on your tenth anniversary of Cold Case Thank Christianity. You. And I remember back when you and I first met, we were talking about the book, and somebody asked you. We were I don't know. We were in a group somewhere, and somebody said, "Would you change anything in Cold Case Christianity?" And this is when Cold Case Christianity was just a few years old. And you said, "Oh yeah, there's t there's lots I would do different, or I would I would change." Well, you've you've gotten your opportunity. <laughs> So yeah, right. what, obviously, I mean, it seems like a good time to update it. What, what are some of the new elements that you've added to the book? Well, you're right. I mean, if you could do another gospel again, and a lot of these books we do are not necessarily evergreen. I kind of felt like cold case is an evergreen book because we're looking at the classic 2000 year old case for Christianity.
Yeah. That's that hasn't changed much. Okay. Those those evidences have been in place for two thousand years. But what happens is you when you write your first book, and that was my first book, like you don't know that you're gonna get a chance to write a second book. <laughs> and you don't have any yeah. idea what this is gonna do, 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 do anything. And so you're just doing your best to get this out in a way that you hope that the publisher will actually publish it. Now, what was interesting for me was I knew that I had a certain length required, you know, like, like limitations. Like there's just so much that my publisher was going to do. And I also wanted to illustrate it. And I knew that the publisher back then was going to be like, he was, they were even saying, well, what, what do you want to do? Now, there were yeah. some uh, illustrated books because uh, our, the publisher of this book, David C. Cook, also published On Guard with William Lane Craig. And there are some illustrations in On Guard, but not nearly as many as I put in. I put 90 graphic elements and illustrations in the original cold case. But when I wrote Person of Interest, you know what, that's like now eight years later, um, that publisher uh, was said, hey, we, we get it. We, we see what you're doing. Go for it. So I have 400 illustrations mm. in person of interest. But we were able to go back right away and add 300 illustrations and graphic elements to cold case. So it reads much more because a lot of these things in cumulative case work, we're doing in front of a jury, you need to see it. I could make a list of these things and mentally I could tell you, well, here's the five reasons why. But if you see the five reasons on the screen, it's like it's easier for you to remember, number one, and it's easier for you to restate. It's just better. So that's the first thing I wanted to do was to, but also you've learned this too, I think when you wrote another gospel, right, then, then you start to get asked to speak about it. And now you're traveling around the country and you're speaking about another gospel. And you know, what happens is you start to realize, you know what, this, like what works in a book doesn't necessarily work in front of an audience and you, you tweak it and you go, oh, dang, I wish I would have written it that way because that is a much quicker yeah. Uh, cut to the chase, uh, persuasive way of stating this. And, or maybe you, you, you figure out an object lesson or a graphic a lesson that, that makes better sense of the objection you're trying to overcome or the point you're trying to make. Well, I learned that too over 10 years. So now I was able to go back and write those back into the book so that those places are more persuasive. And of course, a lot of things do change like archaeology. That's an entirely new section in the book. Um, and and I, there wasn't a single page at least you know, you know how this is. You, you write it and you think when you write it, I'm satisfied with that. Yeah. And then you, then it wasn't even, I think they asked me to read it. I had a professional uh, uh, actor read the book the first time, but then they, they later on came to me and said, no, we want you to read it. So yeah. I read my own book, right? Uh, about five years after the fact. And I remember thinking, Oh, this is terrible. That's like, it's so I, funny that you would bring that up because I've read all my books too. And that's always when I'll catch I remember with both books, I read a line and kind of cringed and thought, and it thankfully it wasn't too late because my books were done before the books came or my audiobooks were done before the books mm, came good. out. So I could make tiny little changes. But there were right. a couple where I was like, Oh, I did I reading it out loud changes yes. the perception, and, doesn't it? Now, now, it can work both ways because I know that sometimes when I'm writing a book, I write the book as though I'm speaking it on a stage and my mm -hmm. wife will say to me, because she's my first editor, she'll say, yeah, I get why you're writing it this way, but this is a book and it doesn't doesn't it doesn't read the same way as you might say it on the stage because on the stage, I can pause, I can emphasize, I can, and you just can't get it sometimes. So it works both ways, but I was able to go back and there wasn't a single page that I didn't change something. And the number of changes are so dramatic, and especially when you start to angle toward all the illustrations we've included, that I think this is a very different book. I think it mm -hmm. covers the same material, but I think it reads like a different book. And I did have people in mind, right, who had already purchased the book. And I thought, well, you know, I kind of feel bad. Like, I wish you would have purchased this better illustrated, better kind of, um, you know, the, the way we approach certain, uh, certain uh, word pictures, certain ways of communicating it. I wish this would have been the first version. But what happens is, you know, you just don't know. And by the way, when I wrote Cold Case the first time, I was in the middle of three jury trials that were in jury, in, in trial. And I remember thinking, there's no, but it was, you know, I just, I got asked to write it and, and, and it was really Sean McDowell who encouraged me to write it. And so I just tried to squeak it in, but yeah. this is different. This is a, now we get a chance to kind of exhale and, mm -hmm. and, and do this in a way that I think is uh, the way I always wanted to do it. So now this is the book I was, I was always intending. Oh, that's great. And a couple of things that really stand out to me about the book, and especially the updated version, is that this isn't 
a typical apologetics book and that you're just walking through arguments for the existence of God and making a, a case, you are making a case, but what you're doing is walking us through your investigation. And what one of the things that really reached me the first time was that I was reading this book thinking, this guy didn't just go read a bunch of apologetics books and then regurgitate the material. He did all of this work himself. Like, I love that you went to the primary sources. You, I love the, the section about the chain of custody of the Gospels and tracing that all the way back. But also, above, that, above and beyond that, you teach really good critical thinking skills to begin with, how to be a detective, how to think like a detective, how to investigate and uh, look at your dangerous presuppositions, look at abductive reasoning and things like that. Um, and so maybe start with letting us know what it, what does it look like to think like a detective in this way when, it, when you're approaching the case for Christianity, particularly with the Gospels? Why start with the Gospels? Well, and that's, yeah, so you're right. I mean, this is, I didn't know what a Christian apologetics was, that there was even a field called Christian apologetics. I mean, I think I can tell you, I didn't read my first Christian apologetics book until maybe about four or five years after Lee wrote Case for Christ. Wow. So that would, so that was probably, you know, in about 2000 or so. So I'd already been a Christian for a number of 2002. So yeah, I didn't, I just didn't, I was not interested in what Christians were. I, this is what I always thought. I'm not interested in what Christians are saying about Christianity. Yeah. I need to know that just need to get back to what are the facts. Part of it too is in jury trials. I never trust expert witnesses. And and this is true. Cause here's what happens. I get this little piece of wire in a case. Okay. This wire means X. That's my claim. I, I call an expert in wire technology. He says, yep, Jim's right. It means X. Well, guess what? The defense is going to have a much better expert that they can afford to pay. I can't afford mm -hmm. to pay for an expert. I got to get the free guy from the county. Yeah. <laughs> he comes in and he testifies on our side. The other side has got the best wire expert in the entire known world. <laughs> he comes in and he testifies and looking at the exact same piece of evidence, both experts, are saying the other one's wrong. I have the exact opposite uh, view of this. So you know what? I don't trust experts. I, jurors, I trust jurors. I, I'm not here to convince experts. I'm here to convince jurors. So that was part of why you know I didn't want to go to some book that's full of expert tests. I don't trust experts. Show me the wire. Let me take a look at the wire myself. I think I'm smart enough to figure out what the wire means. I don't mm -hmm. need your stupid expert to tell me what it means. That's kind of my view. <laughs> so that's why I didn't want to, I went back to the, to zero. And I think that in the end, that's what we need to do. That's one of the first, we try in the book that the first 10 chapters really are just about trying to convince people or trying to help people see what the rules of evidence are. What are the, what, what's the approach we take as detectives? What, what skill sets do you need in place before you can even look at a case like Christianity? So we're the first half of the book is just teaching people how to be a detective. I, that spun off into a whole nother book called Forensic Faith, where we really d deep dive all those kinds of issues. But, but I think sometimes, Elisa, if we just do a better job of helping people understand how evidence works, that does a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Because you'll see people say all the time, oh, there's no, no hard evidence for Christianity. Well, yeah, because yeah. there's no hard evidence for anything. It's not a category. There yeah. are two categories of evidence. And once you know what they are, you'll stop saying silly things like there's no hard evidence because there's not a category in criminal trials called hard evidence as opposed to soft evidence. That's not a category. There's either eyewitness testimony, direct evidence, or everything else, which is called indirect or circumstantial evidence. And once you learn how to leverage those two things, then you realize that, yeah, pretty much every little thing counts every little thing what he said that's evidential what he failed to say that's evidential what did i find in the crime scene that's evidential what did i fail to find i should have been there but wasn't there that's evidential it's all the yin and yang it's all the positives and the negatives together are every single thing has the potential to be considered in a case this is also true for christianity that's why i like to look in the places that people don't look when we wrote person of interest, that was really, a, I wanted to look in the places that no one's looking because it turns out that stuff should be, should count because everything counts. And I think once you help people to see it, and that's why we spent the first half of the book in cold case, just kind of teaching you how to be a detective. And then we leverage those principles in the second half to look exclusively at the gospels. And the reason why we did that is because that was really what I, like I had a, a sociology teacher in high school, great guy. He later became a principal, but I had him when he was still teaching and he was a Baha'i and he loved the writings of Baha'u'llah. And he said, Jim, you need to, cause he knew I was a pretty 
even then I was very skeptical about anything that had to do with God. And he knew that he says, Oh no, no, you need to read Baha'u'llah. Once you read this guy's work, you're going to know this is divine. And I'll tell you that it, it was real. It was amazing. What Baha'u'llah wrote in his own blood, it was just amazing. I, I remember taking these statements of Baha'u'llah and putting them on, on my wall in my bedroom when I was in high school. Not because I believed that there was a God, because I just thought this is the best fortune cookie stuff you could ever possibly yeah. imagine. You know, now that's the, the, the most prophetic claims or most utterances of prophets in the theistic systems are just like Baha'u'llah. They're going to make a statement and you're not going to be able to test it, really. You could say, well, that's that beautiful. Yes. But is it true? Well, I mean, how would you? It's different in Christianity. These are claims of the gospel authors are making historical claims that are rooted in history. Yeah. They're making claims that you could test at least the setting in which Jesus is making these claims. That's locked in for you. Now you could you could ask, is there really a city like that? Was that was the Roman Empire really like that in the first century? Was Jerusalem really like that? You, you could you could test some of these claims in a way that you cannot test Baha'u'llah. So it turns out that that's why I thought this was an important approach to take. And it changed the way I looked at the case. And so I thought, hey, the Gospels are where I'm going to do all my work because they're making claims about the past in a way that cold cases make claims about the past. And I could apply the same set of skills. And so that's what I tried to do. Well, I hope you're enjoying my conversation with Jay Warner Wallace. I am so excited to introduce you to a brand new sponsor today. You know, I take sponsorships really seriously, and I'm really picky about them because I know that one of the ways that you all can support my podcast is to connect with our sponsors and buy their products. So I want to make sure that the products I'm promoting to you are, first of all, products I believe in, ones that I've spent my own money on, and also that they are ethical. And so this is why we turn down many sponsorship requests that come through because they just don't meet that criteria. But today's sponsor meets it, exceeds it. I'm a customer. So excited to introduce you to Carly Jean Los Angeles. Carly Jean Los Angeles is an LA-based clothing company. It was founded by Carly Brannon. She's a mom of four. She's a Christian. I love that Carly Jean Los Angeles uses their resources to be a light. They come alongside pro-life pregnancy centers. And not only that, the clothes are just awesome. In fact, fact, if you go back through the last three or four months of my podcast, almost every top I've worn has been from her basics line. In fact, the t-shirt I'm wearing today is from the Carly Jean basics line. I love that all uh, of the clothes of the basics line are made in the USA, but even the ones that aren't made in the USA are made from family owned businesses where Carly Jean has relationship with them. It's fair wage, they're ethical, healthy work environments. All of that is assured. I love that. So if you want to check them out, go to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. You can use my code, which is my name, Alisa, and you're going to get 20% off your order. That is an amazing deal. So check it out. Go to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Use my code, Alisa, for 20% off. You mentioned convincing a jury, uh, and there's sort of the circumstantial evidence. You're making a cumulative case, and you said something. I don't know. This might be in the book, um, or maybe I've just heard you say it, but you it, it really sort of set something free in me because early on in my journey, I lacked a lot of confidence to really say what I had concluded because I'm not an expert. I'm not really an authority in anything. I'm a you know, ex-pop singer, for heaven's sakes. You know, I, I don't have the authority to say anything. And... And you made a point that I thought was so profound, and I'd love you to expound on it, but you mentioned something about, uh, you, you mentioned the expert witnesses in the jury, and really the average Christian out there, the average person listening to you and I right now, you're the jury. You get to decide. You get to listen right. to the expert witnesses. You get to examine the evidence. I'm just a jury member that has made conclusions based on listening to different experts from different perspectives, looking at the evidence. And that gave me a lot of confidence, Jim, to really say what my conclusions were and have you, and even be able to say them, not on my own authority, but on the fact that, look, I'm the jury. I get to decide. Yes, I remember my, my son, Jimmy, used to say, Pop, one of the things you did for us was you gave us a healthy um, disdain for professors, <laughs> for, <laughs> a healthy disdain for experts. And I, I just because I won't put an expert on a jury. 
You put an expert on a jury. Let's say I've got a case involving a wire, a piece of wire. Okay, great. I've had a case like that. It's on, it's on Dayline. Um, and so I could put a, some, what if I, uh, during the jury selection, I found that one of the potential jurors is somebody who worked in the wire industry. Uh, and you're not getting on the jury because in the end, I'm going to have to call an expert for that. And if you're an expert in that area, good luck trying to tell you anything. You think you know everything already and pride sets in and suddenly you've got an immovable force and that expert who you didn't maybe even know was an expert is now trying to convince the other 11 jurors. No, here's what happens in juries. We put in regular people who are passionate, who are interested, who are attentive and who are humble. And you put those people on the jury and then you allow them to convince each other. That's what we do in regular life is we are all jurors. I'm not an expert in manuscript evidence. I'm not a textual critic of, of the New Testament. I don't have a, a, I have a master's in theology, but I don't have a master's in biblical studies or a PhD in biblical studies. I'm like you, I'm a juror, but I do understand the rules of evidence. And if I can help you to understand the rules of evidence, you'll realize you don't need, as a matter of fact, the problem I have with experts is often they've built a career off of a set of claims that they will never budge from because that's what their career is dependent upon. I need jurors who don't have those kinds of biases involved, who don't have those kinds of goals involved, who could just look at this. Now, in the end, I don't want people to look at me as an, as an expert. No, I'm just a, the, maybe like I'm like the lead juror or I'm another juror that you uh, elected as foreman. I'm just you uh, who just is looking at this evidence and, and I'm going to help work it together. We're going to work through it. And, and that's where I think that all of us, and this is where we have to stop thinking we need another million dollar apologist. I say this all the time. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, by the way, to put this in this book. This is my first book. And I wanted the last chapter. I, I wrote a chapter called about being an abbreviated Christian. That was not what I wanted to write. Mm. I wanted to write about, we don't need another million dollar apologist. And because this is my first book though, my agent was like, dude, you, you, you're going to insult every apologist out there. You can't say that. Uh, my claim was you don't need another million dollar apologist. You need a million one dollar apologist because yeah, that's what I consider point. myself. Yeah. And that's what I consider all of us in the kingdom. So I would say this, uh, that I ended up putting, I think that maybe, maybe it's in for, I ended up later on being able to put it in a book, but the first book, they wouldn't let me do it. Hmm. But the reality of it is, is that that's what we are, is we are one dollar apologists. And if everybody was a one dollar apologist who understood the rules of evidence and had worked through this, look. I now am doing a lot of counseling with police officers who have been involved in terrible, terrible uh, messes, shootings where they've been critically injured, uh, suffered trauma, their partner has died in their hands, these kinds of things, and now they're struggling. And um, many of them come to us as Christians, hmm. but they're still struggling. And you know why they're struggling? There's in large part, they're struggling because they don't know for sure. They, they want it to be true. They hope it's true. Hmm. But there is a level of doubt in their minds about whether it's true. And I'll tell you that this is one of the things we talk about. The next book I just wrote is coming out next year. That book really focuses on these lessons I've learned is that really what helps people to survive trauma is something secularists called meaning making. I, as a Christian, call it meaning finding. And it's the idea that when you understand why this, how this trauma that's occurred to you actually has set you up for something even more glorious. You will flourish. You'll have what they call post-traumatic growth mm. because you actually can find a place for your trauma in the larger arc, the larger narrative of your life story. And these Christians who suffer these kinds of traumas, because they're not quite sure that it's evidentially true, they're not sure if they can trust that they could interpret this trauma in light of an overarching God mm. story if they're not sure there really is a God. So I think this is why it's so important for us as Christians to know that this is evidentially true because it does help us then to even overcome trauma. You know, my wife and I right now are going through Job, which is the longest book ever. No, it's not that bad. But I mean, it seems like it sometimes when you're like in chapter 20 of it, you know. Yeah. All this, and all but, the back and I, forth. and the... All the back and forth. It's very yeah. beautiful, though. It's a great yeah. book. and. And we've studied, and so now we're looking at it again, and we're thinking, wow, you know, this is really a story about how do I find a place for my suffering? How do I make sense of it? And I think that if you want to make sense of your suffering as a Christian, well, one thing that will help is if you know it's true, because there'll be days when you don't feel it, you're not feeling it, but you can yeah. still know it's true. That's why this approach is important.
I hope you're enjoying this conversation with Jay Warner Wallace as much as I am. I want to take a moment and let you know about another one of our sponsors for today, and that is Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers is American meat delivered right to your door. We love it. Almost all the meat that we eat in our household comes from Good Ranchers. And not only is it high quality, we're talking uh, grass-fed No antibiotics, no hormones, uh, beef, better than organic chicken. Not only is it high quality, but it's so convenient because you just put it right in your freezer. In fact, just this past weekend, my husband and I celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary, and we went away for the weekend, and my mom and dad stayed with the kids, and it was so great to just say, hey, we've got a freezer full of Good Ranchers meat, and I'm telling you, they made steaks, they made chicken, they all loved it. So convenient and high quality, better than the than the meat that you're buying in the store. So this is a good time to subscribe to Good Ranchers because if you subscribe right now, you're gonna get two years of free ground beef. That is an amazing deal, two years of free ground beef. So go to GoodRanchers.com, use my code ALISA for $25 off your first box, and don't forget to lock in that two years of free ground beef. So that's GoodRanchers.com, use my code ALISA for $25 off your first box. Oh, so important. And I second that because it's been ever since I've learned some of these things and evidence for the resurrection and the reliability of the Bible, it has solidified me in times that have gotten really dark and would have otherwise maybe caused me to question my whole worldview. It's just going back and appealing to the evidence, even uh, enduring the death of a of a close family member. It was the evidence for the resurrection that keep, kept me solid, just thinking, you know what? I can stand on this. And and like you said, you know that if it is true, then God does have this overarching narrative for your life. And, and it all is making sense, even if we don't see it at the time. And I love it. I, I even tell audiences of young people, I, I sort of reference you on this, where I say, the great thing about learning the evidence is that that way you can just relax. And you know that it's true on the days right. you feel it and the days you don't feel it. Do you ever not feel it? Yeah, great. Well, you can know that it's still true and you're still saved. Jesus is real. He is who he said he was. He raised from the dead. And you don't have to like work up some kind of a feeling. Cause I think a lot of young people right now feel that way, that they have to be, you know, hearing something or feeling something in order for it to be real or true. So the evidence is so important. I'd, I'd love for us to sort of put that in context here in the book, like walk through some of the evidence that you present in the book. For example, one of the things that I've encountered online quite a bit is if you quote the the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, people come on and say, oh, that, that wasn't written by eyewitnesses. It was written way too late to be eyewitnesses. And you address that in the book. And I'd love for our viewers and listeners to be able to be equipped with some information on that topic. So what do we say to people when they say, oh, these weren't eyewitnesses. It was just, too, they were all too late. And Right. Something like well, that. Well, think about, think about this. In the 2,000-year history of Christianity, when do you think that statement, these were written too late to have been written by eyewitnesses, when do you think that was probably first uttered? It wasn't uttered in the first 1,800 years of the, of the faith system. This is a relatively new claim, and, and that's why you need to address it, because the, 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 what I try to do in the book is give you the four legs of reliable eyewitness testimony. Were they written or um, was a witness really there to see what they said they saw? Can they be corroborated in some way? Do they change their story over time? And finally, do they possess a bias or a motive to lie? So those are the four things we allow jurors to think about when they're assessing eyewitnesses. And that first question, were they really there to see what they said they saw, comes down to were these written early enough to have been written by eyewitnesses, these gospels, because the best thing you could do, if you want to lie about Jesus, or just wait till everyone knows the truth is dead. Then you can say whatever you want about Jesus. So yeah. if these are late, you have a better chance of saying, of telling them, they're, but one thing for sure, they cannot even begin to qualify as eyewitness accounts if they're written in the second century. So the question is, are these written in the first century? I think there's many good reasons to believe they are. And I kind of lay them out in the timeline uh, in the, one of the chapters of the book just to make the case that this is early enough. All the Gospels are lacking the elements that would clearly have been in the Gospels had they been written in the second century. And there is no good manuscript reason to believe that they were written in the second century. When you ask people, like, what is the foundation upon which these critics would say this is written late? Is it because they've got some manuscript evidence that that demonstrates they are written? No. It's, and I talked about this with, with, um, uh, 
Dan Wallace, who's not a relative of mine, but it, right. he's another scholar. And, and he was, I said, what do you think is the, the main, like, what are they, he is really aware of all the manuscript evidence because his, his ministry photographs the manuscripts. And so I wanted to know, was there some like evidential reason? No, it's based on two things. Number one, what's well, one thing? It's, it's, it's a bias against the supernatural. Because when you have a prediction of, of, in, of a prophetic utterance of Jesus in the Gospels, which predicts the destruction of the temple, which we know occurred in 70 AD, well, then skeptics are going to say, well, then clearly it was written after 70 AD. Well, why? Because they don't believe that anyone could actually predict such a thing. That would be supernatural, and I've got a bias against the supernatural. Therefore, I've got to date it post-70, even though there's a lot of other good evidence in the Gospels and in the Book of Acts that puts it pre-70. Don't care. There's no way he could have accurately predicted that. Not only that, uh, if you're suggesting that somehow this was this had to be written after eyewitnesses were dead because there are tons of miracles described on the pages of the New Testament, and we know those didn't happen because we have a bias against the supernatural. Right. So therefore, they must have been written after everyone's dead. But that bias is what's the that's the tail that wags the dog called late dating. So I think in the end we have to ask the question: Well, do we have any good evidence? And I think the stuff that's missing in the in the Book of Acts is dramatic. That book of Acts is missing. The deaths of all the major players in the book of Acts are not mentioned, even though Luke mentions the death of James, the brother of John. Okay, that is a nobody mm -hmm. in, in terms of who people were in the first century in Christianity. Yeah, he was one of the disciples, but he dies in 44. You don't have anything mentioned in that book about the death of James, the brother of Jesus, who ran the largest church in the world at the time in Jerusalem, was the the chief uh, leader of the first Christian council ever held in Acts chapter 15, I think it is. So you know he was a bigwig and and spectacular death, missing. That was in 61. There's no death of Peter. Should be like, see, he's somebody. No death, yeah. no, death, no death of Paul is mentioned. You mentioned the death of James, the brother of, and Stephen. Those are mentioned but not the death of James, the brother of Jesus, Peter, not even Barnabas. Barnabas dies in 61. That death's not mentioned. These are people who had major roles to play in the, in the story. No description of the temple being destroyed in 60. No, dis no description of the siege of Jerusalem. There, there are good reasons to believe that that book is written before the first missing piece, which would put it around 60. And then, of course, you have him writing the Gospel of Luke earlier. He says that in his first mm -hmm. chapter of Acts. So that means that's before 60. And then you have Paul quoting Luke's Gospel in his letter to the Corinthian church. You have him quoting it in his letter to Timothy. It was clear that Luke's Gospel is available early enough and yeah. it was considered scripture when he's writing to Timothy and yeah. was cited as authoritative as early as the earliest years of the 50s. In the book he wrote to the Corinthians, there's good reason to believe these are written early. And that was always the claim of Christendom. That was always the belief of Christ. It's not as though people in the second century were saying, you know, these, these new gospels we have, it's like there's no evidence yeah. uh, in, in recorded history which suggests late dating. It's a bias against the supernatural that wags the dog. Yeah. That blew my mind when I read that about... Uh, Luke's gospel being considered scripture. And even there's, I think, uh, in maybe first or second Peter referencing Paul's letters on par yes. with scripture. That was mind blowing to know that that's right there in the New Testament. It's so cool. Yeah. Now, I wonder if a skeptic might say, okay, well, you've, you've said that they would have mentioned certain deaths. They would have mentioned the destruction of Jerusalem. But isn't that an argument from silence? H how would you approach a skeptic who might say that? Yes, everything. Yes, absolutely. It's an argument from silence. The question is, is supported by anything else? So the argument from silence in the book of Acts is supported by the argument that's not silent, uh, the quoting of Luke's gospel in both the letters of Paul to the Corinthian yeah. church and to Timothy. So it's an, it's not just that it's, and also it's true that, that Paul's letters, nobody doubts, by the way, like even Bart Ehrman does not doubt that Paul's letter to the Corinthians is written in the early 50s. And that claim in 1 Corinthians 15, includes the earliest claims yeah. about Jesus and the resurrection. You're not going to get away. You're, there's yeah. no way to ditch this idea that, the, the, again, I'm not always, um, this is now, this is my bias, okay? I'm not always interested in the same things that Christians are interested in mm -hmm. when, it come, when, I, when I was first examining the scriptures. Like inerrancy was not something I was after. 
Now, today, do I believe in the, yes, I believe in inerrancy, but back then I didn't care. I just mm -hmm. needed to know, is this outline, was the claim in general being made early? Yes, it was. If you're going to argue that somehow nobody talked about a resurrected Christ until the second century, you're just out of your mind. It's not, it's not the case. And that's the most outrageous claim about Christianity was that Christ rose from the grave. And that claim is very, very early in history. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, Gary Habermas has probably done the best, and you've had him on your show, um, you know, has done the best in terms of tracing back those earliest claims. Yeah. And you trace back through Galatians, you trace back through the book of Acts. You can see when did Paul have the road uh, to Damascus vision? When did he then meet with the disciples? What did they tell him? How early was this claim being made in history? Well, he can trace it back, I think, to within about three years of the actual event. And that is a, good enough for me. Now, yeah. if you said, well, all these details, though, well, okay, what, I, what I'm most concerned about was somebody saying that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the grave. That's what I'm most concerned yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they said, you know, afterwards he had a pizza or he had an apple pie. Do I really care? The claim is he rose from the grave. Yeah. That's enough for me to take this, start taking this seriously. And that's really how I started. Yeah, because a lot of people will point out that there are differences between the Gospels. You might read a story in Matthew, and it, there's a little bit of different details going on in Mark. Some people might call those things yeah. a contradiction. And your perspective on yeah. this as a detective is very unique and was very enlightening to me when I read about it, especially when you told the story in the book about the four eyewitnesses that all got put into the same car because it was raining. Will you share that with us and how that relates to New Testament reliability? Yeah, the only thing we ask for when I've worked, like I worked fresh homicides for five years before I started working cold cases. Now, this cold case are just unsolved murders because every other case closes by statute, but cold case homicides don't don't close. So there are no cold case burglaries or cold case robberies. They're just cold case murders. But when you work a fresh murder, and I'm always, you know, I live about 45 miles from where I work in Los Angeles County, and that's not an easy 45 miles because I'm in Los Angeles County. So it's like, if I'm going to get called out in the middle of the night, it's probably a straight drive, but I'm probably going to take an hour to get there to get dressed. I can put a suit on. I have a suit ready, but I got to get ready and get, get in the car. So I asked the dispatcher to do one thing for me, only one thing, separate the eyewitnesses. Make sure that the officer is there. Don't let these eyewitnesses talk to each other, because if you let them talk to each other, you're going to get pretty much one story five times rather than five slightly different stories. And that's what you want because the puzzle pieces have different shaped edges. And my job is to put the pieces together and that when the only when the pieces are put together, we get the entire picture. So I'm not looking for you to make every piece the same. I need to know what you saw and there'll be some differences. By the way, the defense teams are always going to exploit these differences. I'm over it. Uh, that's mm. what's going to happen. But the reality of it is we'll be able to show the jury that these are just puzzle pieces that fit together and they actually make sense of each other. And remember, I'm not after inerrancy when I was first examining this. Right. I'm after puzzling. And so when I first read the Gospels, I was struck immediately by those differences and encouraged. In fact, it was those differences that started the, if I hadn't seen those differences, if there had been one claim, just one gospel, one book of Acts, not four gospels, just one, I'm not sure I would have started the investigation because that would have, okay, it would have been a nice set of claims. But what provoked me was, oh, these are four claims that are all slightly different in exactly the degree to which I would expect four eyewitnesses to be slightly different. It's not as though they weren't aware of each other. It's not as though, I mean, Luke quotes Mark more than any other source, yet there are changes being made. Well, what's that about? Because he's talking to all the eyewitnesses and he's just reporting what they are telling him. And that's the beauty of it is that they are slightly different. And when I read that, I thought, oh, this is this is worth testing now, because this is at least passing my first intuitive test, which is that these are all lining up perfectly. Mm. And that's exactly what I it, there's no. I, and I used to do this in my youth group all the time. I'd have I'd be in front of the youth group and I have someone run in, slap me in the head and run out the other door. And <laughs> I couldn't even get these 50 students to agree on the sex of the suspect. Yeah. And yeah. you're thinking, really, it just happened five seconds ago. But it turns out that you uh, it's not just your perspective in the room that dictates your observations. It's your life perspective. It's your interests. It's your history. It's your preferences. It's your worldview. All of these things impact the way you see an event and the way you then report the event. That's why it's so important for us in front of the jury 
that if we think there's like, you know, a, a change in that, like if say, let's say the defense team pulls up a witness. Well, I think I'll help to show the jury. Like, what is the perspective from which this witness is testifying? Oh, she's the cousin of the defendant. Okay. So, so, I mean, there are some things we're looking at to say, you know, perspective matters and it's not just your geographic perspective. It's often the, the, your personal history and what your goals in life are, what you're trying to, what point you're, look, if I'm writing one of these as a quick dispatch, it's going to have one kind of flavor. If I'm writing one of these, because I'm trying to convince the Jews in my life, one kind of flavor. If I'm writing one of these, because you've said a lot about Jesus, but now I want you to focus on this stuff that showed me that he was God, another kind of difference. Yep. And that's what we see in the gospels. You know, I put this to the test after I read your book. Uh, early in my apologetics teaching ministry, I would do youth apologetic series, maybe six weeks, 10 weeks, depending on on the church and, and what we were doing. And very often when we got to the reliability of the authors, I would, or, you know, just maybe looking at some of the differences between the gospels, I would take four volunteers and I did the, and it worked every single time. It worked exactly the same. Every time I did it, I would take four volunteers and I would walk out of the room with the four volunteers and I would tell them a little story. And then I wouldn't let them hear the other one. And I'd bring them in one one by one, and I say, explain what happened. And you would have thought that they all had four completely different experiences, and yet they were all telling the truth. Everything they said actually happened. Um, but maybe one person was more focused on the story I told. Another person was focused on what was going on in the hallway. And it was it was just funny. And it was really persuasive, I think, to a lot of students to see that really play out. Like nobody's telling the exact same story. And if they did come in and word for word say the exact same thing, you would probably be suspicious that they figured out what they were going to say and they were just reciting a script. So I, I that definitely played out and worked out well uh, when I taught it. Yeah. And I can tell you this, if let's say you, you, you intentionally said, okay, I'm going to pick four different. I got a guy who's an auto mechanic in his forties. I've got a woman who's a grandmother in her sixties. I've got a teenager who's 15 and I've got that just those three. Now you tell them the same story. Now, now ask yourself before you even get a response, um, which one of these three, uh, this, this event occurred in a, in a restaurant and there was music playing. A, a current song playing. Which one of those three do you think would be able to identify the song? Yeah. Uh, you said, oh, and he's wearing, uh, and, and he's wearing a certain kind of clothing. Uh, which one of those three will be able to identify the clothing? In other words, it turns out you can almost predict in advance where this the testimony is probably going to be more focused just once you know the differences between your witnesses. And that's what's so powerful about this. And that's why it's important for us to know the differences between Luke and Mark yeah. and who is Mark. And by the way, okay, so is Mark, I hear all this time, well, Mark's not an eyewitness. Okay, I, I get it, duh. Uh, but if I was trying to fool you, wouldn't I have given that gospel the name of an eyewitness? Like you're thinking, exactly. it's so brutally honest that it's Mark, a nobody who's even like, sounds like an idiot in the book of Acts, right? In the early yeah. part of Acts when Barnabas yeah. wants to take him and, and Paul's like, no, he's not going with me. Okay. So, so that, but yet, yet that's who wrote it. And he's writing it according to Papias at the feet of Peter. And that's why I wanted to test. That's one of the chapters of this book is me just testing the book of Mark to see if Peter's fingerprints were really in it. So I think in the end, yeah, Luke, but, and Luke tells you he's not an eyewitness in the gospel of Luke, but at least he tells you, and who's he talking to? Eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So, yeah. I mean, I think in the end, um, there was good enough reason for me to, to begin an investigation and using that technique, using those, uh, those four areas of concern. And as I did that, like I ended up in the end of it, like, okay, I'm, I'm stuck with this guy. I remember telling Susie, this claim about the resurrection, I know it sounds insane, but it does seem like it checks every box. Mm. And wow. so I'm not sure what to do with it. I, I can tell you this, though. I am still concerned. Like, I don't get why God would have to come and die on a cross to begin with. In other words, I was becoming convinced that the Gospels were telling me the truth before I ever, ever understood the Gospel, <laughs> right? Mm. Because yeah. I wasn't concerned with the Gospel. I wasn't, like, in church to get saved. I just wanted to know, is this, did this really happen? And maybe yeah. nine months to a year into this, I remember telling Susie, but do you understand why this it, God would have to do it this way? And she goes, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know either. And so that began that turn from the Gospels to the Gospel. Mm. 
And that's something yeah. that I think I'm more as I get older, and you probably feel the same way. I'm a lot older than you, but I think the more we do this, the more I realize that my apologetics don't, don't do anything. The gospel fixes every kind of stupid you can think of. <laughs> and we are surrounded by a lot of stupid right now. Yeah. And it, 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 the solution to all of it, in one form or another, is simply the gospel. It has all yeah. the power. It's not The power is not in my case. But I knew that I wasn't going to hear the gospel. I would have never gotten to that second question. Why would God do it this way if I didn't first believe that God did something I could trust in the first century? Hmm. And that's what opened the door for me to hearing the gospel. So I think for a lot of us who are stubborn, and for a lot of Christians who already believe the gospel, but they're still suffering, and this is what I get when I do this counseling, is that every single person comes up who's a Christian is still struggling. Yeah. And it's because they've never looked at their faith this way. They've never examined yeah. the claims of Christianity this way. So it feels like I could apply this overarching narrative to my life or pretty much any other overarching narrative. That's why the secular people call this meaning making, as if you could pick any meaning mm. and make something of it. But we know that you don't make meaning you find meaning. It's it's there before you start looking. I can't just invent a story and make my life work. But yeah. I could find the true story about how my life really is and figure out where my life falls in that true story. I could find the, the meaning to make sense. I don't make meaning to make sense. You find meaning to make sense. And that's why we have to know, is this something that's objectively true that we could actually find? Yeah. Well, let's talk about the reliability of what they actually wrote, because we've talked about how to reconcile some of the differences, and we, we've we not touched on the manuscript evidence so much in this podcast, although I have done several podcasts on the manuscript evidence. But as a, as a detective, from your perspective, what motivation might they have? Like, can you think of any, any reason they might have to lie? If, if they were going to make this up, why would they do it? And, and how do you approach that as a detective? Yeah, I can think of it. I could think of what, what what might be behind this. If this was a lie, I think I know what category it would fall in. The same category that Bart Ehrman says it falls in. So there are only three reasons why anyone lies. I don't know that Bart actually even knows the three categories, but you learn these working homicides. And I then discovered them probably 25 years later on the pages of scripture. I was a Christian for some time before I realized, oh, that verse right there, that actually captures it. But for me, it's always going to come down to these three things. And, and one of these three accounts for about 70% of stupid that you see, criminal stupid. Um, and so the first one is, is is greed, financial greed. That motivates a lot of stuff, including lies. By the way, the same things that motivate lies are the same things that motivate murders and robberies and every sin anyone has ever committed. There are not four motivations for sin. There are only three. Now, I will tell you, these three stand on a pedestal, kind of like the gold and the silver and the bronze at the Olympics. They're standing mm -hmm. on one pedestal, right? Well, the pedestal they're standing on is called pride. Okay. Right. It's, yeah. it's called pride. And pride is the problem for, for everything in the world is <laughs> pride. You could go back and say, well, why are we having this problem in, in the world? Why are we having that problem? It's going to come back to the pride. And, and in, the, in the end, that means that we know what the solution is. The solution for pride is humility. It's really simple. So it turns out that once you know what the one motivating factor is behind all evil, you actually know how to fix it. It means we would have to adopt humility because mm. that's what fixes pride which is one of the reasons why you and I have talked about this, that I have stepped back a little bit from some of the public stuff. Yeah. But really, after after Ravi Zacharias, I just thought that we have to really guard ourselves against, it's, it's yeah. about how do you, and by the way, you can't pursue humility. Humility is a realization. It's not a pursuit. Yeah. It's like what Mike Adams it. used to say, yeah. right? You know, how I, I wrote a book, how I uh, learned how to become humble, how to become humble in, in 10 easy steps and how yeah. I made it in eight, right? Yeah. So, so that's like, you can't do it. But in the end, these three things motivate crimes. And that is the pursuit of money, the uh, sex and relationships. So it's, it's either, it's either financial greed or sexual lust. And the third category is about 70% of every other kind of crime. And that's the pursuit of power. Mm. That is very nuanced. So when someone walks yeah. into a, 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 a Walmart and shoots 70 people who are a different skin color, what is that about? That's about me thinking, Mike, I'm more important than you. My, my race is more important. That's a pursuit of power. When uh, you steal from your parents to support your drug habit, that's, that's a pursuit of power issue. My high is more important than your inconvenience. 
Uh, these are things that are, are, are nuanced. When a one gangster shoots another gangster because he's been disrespected, that's a pursuit of power thing. So that covers a lot of sin. Well, here's the great thing about knowing the three categories. Well, you ask the question, why are the disciples lying? Well, it's for one of those three categories. And I would guess it's going to be in the third category because that's 70% of all lying is the pursuit of power. And that's exactly where Bart Ehrman says it is. He says, yeah, these people became important figures in history for what? Why? Why do we know about Paul at all? Well, because he wrote gospel. He wrote letters. Okay. So that's what they were after, that kind of notoriety. And I'm thinking to myself, now remember, that's why we talk about the difference between possible and reasonable. That's that's definitely possible. But I don't think it's reasonable, especially given the fact that Paul started off in a better position with a larger religious group and much more authority, at least to begin with. He's going to jump out of that position as one of the best trained Pharisees of Pharisees with yeah. the group that has the power to destroy these Christians. And he's going to jump in with this group. And then, as he says, get his rear end kicked all over the planet for the next 30 years, hoping to someday have the power he already had. Mm -hmm. I just don't think this explanation works, especially since that if you think about it, you, these folks didn't see the kind of, of um, expectation they might have had in their own lifetime. Yeah, 400 years in, they could say, wow, we did something. But they've been dead for 300 years by that time. Yeah. So I think in the end, by the way, that kind of motivation also only works if you've got one defendant. If I've got 10, I can't assume that all 10 are similarly motivated. There's just too many, and people aren't like that. We, we are nuanced in what motivates us. So I just think in the end, that explanation, mm -hmm. while it's possible, it's just not reasonable. And that's why I thought, okay, they, they, they passed that third category as well. They didn't get rich. They didn't get girlfriends and they really didn't get powerful. They didn't even have the power to stop their own martyrdoms. They didn't have yeah. the power to stop their own, the, the way they were abused to keep themselves out of jail. Like what power did they have? That power we're thinking of is centuries away mm. and it's not motivating the initial eyewitnesses. And that's why I think it's, it's not a good explanation. Yeah. And persuasive to me, too, is just that willingness to be tortured and be killed for what they testified that they saw. I mean, I think you and I hopefully would be willing to die for what we believe to be true. We, I would hope that if the time came, the Holy Spirit would give us the power to do that. And a lot of people will, even of other religions and other worldviews. But I, I just can't think of anyone in history, myself included, who would be willing to go through all of that pain and suffering and even death for something you actually knew you made up and that wasn't That's true. Right. That there's, yeah, and, there's nothing in it for you in that, at that point. So that's well, a as great we close, point. And, yeah, yeah go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. That's a great point because I think we hear this all the time. Well, people tell lies all the time for religious claims. People fly planes into buildings for things that aren't true. And that's the difference is that, yeah, that's, that's why you and I are that our claims, our, our willingness to die for this has no evidential value because people die all the time for what they don't know is a lie. But this is the one group that would know if it's a lie. And that's yep. why their death has high evidential value in a way that ours doesn't. Yeah. And that's just the difference between people who don't know and people who do. And let's face it, the people who are flying planes in the buildings, they're, they're centuries removed from the claims. So they don't know. They're, just, they're trusting. It. And so that's, that's the difference, right. I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, as we close out here, let everyone know how they can connect with you, where they can get the book, if you have any extra goodies you're offering, all that good stuff. Yeah, I think that part of it for us in this stage of our work is like, what can we do to motivate the church to take the steps? You know that when you write Christian apologetics books, you're in a very small niche category. A small percentage of Christians, which are becoming a shrinking percentage of the general population. And you're thinking to yourself, why can't we get folks to actually take this seriously? Like take the evidence seriously. Even those of us who would say we identify as Christians. So what, I think we're at a stage right now, and Susie and I are at a stage where we're like, hey, what can we do that we can just like make available? So we've done that with this book. Uh, if you go to uh, coldcasechristianitybook.com, you will see in the header probably your image, Lisa, because you're on all of our social media <laughs> on this book. So you'll see that, that that's where we offer um, some giveaways with this. So once this thing is published and it goes live, anybody who buys them and reviews the book, well, then we're going to send them, number one, a 410 slide PowerPoint presentation with every image from the book animated in, and annotated also. So you know where to find it in the book wow. if you wanted to teach this to others. But we created a 30 video case making course that takes you all the way from truth 
to um, to to evidence for God's existence, to the reliability of Scripture and the impact of Jesus. It's thirty videos. It's about ten and a half hours of content. It's the course I teach at Gateway Seminary. We just we collected all those videos and we created a written course for it, and that's available for free. We just want people to start studying the evidence. And so we're making that available also for people who buy this this uh, updated edition and about 40 plus Bible inserts with all of the major illustrations uh, positioned in a way that'll help you remember the case. And you can either print those out and stick them in your Bible or you can just hold on to them digitally and so you can review them later but the, or make a case to somebody on your phone. But the point is we're just trying to get people to move from what I call being an abbreviated Christian. Like you made one of two decisions. You, you decided to, to trust Christ for your but you haven't decided to prepare yourself to be able to share Jesus, to be able to make a, a case for the reason for the hope you have. You haven't done that yet. You, you, you've said yes to Jesus, but not yes to case making when we're called to do it. So that's why I say you, you're probably in an abbreviated position. But if you want to be unabbreviated, well, then you have to take the next step. Well, how do you do that? Well, I always tell people, do whatever you can for free first before you must spend a dollar on a book. But a lot of what we're going to try to do is take you as deep as we can, and books do that, right? Books can take yeah. you deeper than all the stuff we provide with over a thousand articles online. Yeah, but you know, to be honest, they're bite-sized pieces of the book. So what we want to do is reward people by saying, "Here's an entire thirty-session course, ten hours that'll get wow. you from A to Z." Oh, that's great. Well, I want to thank my guest, uh, Jay Werner Wallace, for joining us on the podcast today. Please take advantage of these great resources. Pick up the book, Cold Case Christianity, 10th Anniversary Expanded Edition with all new illustrations and some additional information. Uh, pick that up uh, on Amazon, wherever books are sold, and go to coldcasechristianitybook.com to get those extras. And today's podcast is sponsored in part by Southern Evangelical Seminary, where I am a student. Go to ses.edu slash Alisa. You can download a free ebook there and take a look at what SES has to offer. I love SES. I'm a student at SES. So again, go to ses.edu slash Alisa and download your free ebook there. And in the meantime, as we pursue Christ, let's remember to keep a sharp mind, a soft heart, and a thick skin. We'll see you next time.